Hello, Westwood. Well, in what is maybe a little bit of an ironically fitting way, we're going to finish today a sermon series on following God in the midst of uncertainty, where I'll be actually matching Pastor Scott's video update from his back porch by getting the sermon from my back patio. So um, I'm going to, since we're doing it this way instead of in person, I'm going to try to give just a shorter version, about a 10 minute version instead of a 20 minute version of this message. So Yes, I know, maybe there are some silver linings with having to make this change. But the story we're going to look at in the life of Abraham and Sarah here is what I think is for sure the most troubling, the most difficult story. It's a story where God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac. And while there is a great comfort, I think, that comes from this story and a tremendous amount of of enduring wisdom, Nonetheless, it is a troubling story, and I make no bones about that. So uh, the story itself is found in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 19. So I'm going to be reading that from the New Living Translation. Let me go ahead and do that and then just share a few thoughts on it. So again, taking from Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 19, it says this. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God told them to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. And at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yireh, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed all because you have obeyed me. Then they turned, they returned to the servants and traveled back to Beersheba where Abraham continued to live. My friends, this is God's word to us today. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your word as always. In certain times, uncertain times, and everything in between. And even for a story such as this that is troubling, we give you thanks and want to yield ourselves to its work. Amen. Well, like I said, let me just kind of share with you the short version of the message. Much could be said. Much actually has been said about this story. In fact, its title itself is sort of telling in the way that people have struggled with what to make of this story. Sometimes it's called the sacrifice of Isaac, but that didn't actually happen. So sometimes in the Jewish tradition, especially, it's called the binding of Isaac. Uh, In some Bibles, they even want to change the heading to Uh, to call it Abraham's test or the test of Abraham's faith, even further removing the title from really the disturbing nature of the story itself. And it is a disturbing story. I mean, first of all, God is telling Abraham to sacrifice a human being. Now, animal sacrifice in the ancient world was a common practice, even though it's a bit foreign to us. And the short version of what 
animal sacrifice was about is it was about um, it was about gratitude, it was about trust, and sometimes it was about dealing with sin and guilt. Um, sometimes a mixture of those things, um, but in the end, a sacrifice of an animal was about taking what was produced for a certain purpose and then not using it for that purpose, offering it up to God in faith. And yet, in Israel, never was human sacrifice close to acceptable. First of all, because at the beginning of the biblical story, God makes it clear that human beings are uniquely made among all of creation in God's image. In fact, that's part of why in uh, the Old Testament, eventually, human sacrifice becomes like the iconic infamous hallmark of what happens in foreign nations when they worship false gods is that it turns not into worship but into a superstition and they try to appease God by any means possible including this the worst of the worst the idea of human sacrifice so it was crazy when this story sets out and tells and where God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac but what's more is this wasn't just any human it was Isaac he was the long awaited long promised son who was going to be the bearer of the blessing to Abraham that was then going to be a blessing to the whole world so if he's gone how's that going to carry on well as troubling as this story is and it is the writer wants us to know as the hearer or reader of the story right off the bat that God never intends for Abraham to carry it through, but that instead this was supposed to be a test of his faith. Now that test was necessary because Abraham had faced lots of tests in his walk with God since God called him to leave the land of his fathers and uh, be led by God to the place where his descendants would inherit the land and that someday they would be a blessing to the whole world. Um, God had given him lots of tests and Abraham had failed the most. And now near the end of Abraham's life, he's kind of put to the final test, the test to which all the other tests were ultimately leading. And in part, at least, I think we can surmise that that test was given and it was necessary because Abraham's love for his son had grown so much that perhaps it was bordering on becoming an idol, that a, that Isaac was actually becoming a god for Abraham instead of God himself. I like the way Christian writer A.W. Tozer put it. He said that because of this perhaps mixed order of loves, that a Abraham was beginning to love Isaac too much, that this story represents God stepping in at just the right moment, and here's how Tozer puts it, to save both father and son from the consequences of an uncleansed love. And that phrase and that interpretation of the story has always been, uh, really, has really resonated with me. And in part because maybe, um, like me, you can identify with the fact that sometimes our loves can become disordered. And that that actually, actually leads to a lot of disaster, not, uh, not a lot of good. Even though we sometimes may set out to love a person in a way that ends up becoming almost like an idol with the best of intentions. So the test was necessary, and the test worked. In fact, Abraham passed this test, and the end of that passage says that because of that, this blessing was repeated again to, Isaac, to Abraham, affirmed, and then passed along to Isaac. So again, the story is troubling, but it's also strangely enduring. It has been passed down through the generations by people of faith for literally thousands of years, despite how disturbing the story is, despite how much dissonance there is of imagining God asking Abraham to sacrifice Isaac for all the reasons we just said and more. But I think part of the reason that this has been so enduring is because all of us come to times of our own faith when it's tested. Times when the order of our loves or our trust in God is tested. And I like to think about kind of a general summary of all of those testings of faith as being a test of our joyful confidence in God, which is a phrase I like, but I can't claim credit for. A couple of years ago, I had the chance to be at a conference in California where uh, we're, uh, one of the speakers was a man named John Ortberg, who's a pastor and author. Actually, Pastor Scott just mentioned him a couple of weeks ago. John Ortberg talked about a time in his life when he was dealing with an incredibly difficult issue in the lives of, in the life of one of his grown children's lives. Um, and he talks about it being such a dark, difficult time where he despaired even of life itself. And he prayed many times, prayed desperately, sought wise counsel from lots of friends, um, and received a lot of encouragement, support, perspective prayer from friends, but then he said he did what he often did when he was at the end of his rope, which was beyond prayer and asking other people for help, but go to one of his personal mentors, a man named Dallas Willard. 
Dallas Willard is one of the brightest minds, one of the uh, most trustworthy um, writers, authors, philosophers of a generation who passed away seven or eight years ago now, but was a personal mentor of John Ortberg. So John Ortberg, after going to other people, eventually went to Dallas Willard and explained the whole situation. And John Ortberg says there was a long pause because there was always a long pause with Dallas. And then Dallas simply said, this will be a test of your joyful confidence in God. The whole phrase matters. Joyful is a way of speaking to this well-rounded, complete sense of well-being despite the outward circumstances. Confidence being this eager expectation that God will do good even though things right now don't look good. And that it ultimately it's not about it, uh, things will probably work out okay in the end. It's a joyful confidence in God, resting and relying on God's personal goodness and presence to ultimately do what is right and best. You know, when we come to our own times of testing and faith, sometimes we pray and God answers in specific ways and in intervening in a situation. And sometimes God chooses to let the natural course of events play out as it otherwise would without directly intervening. But what we can know for sure is that regardless of how God responds, God always does what is best, what is ultimately good from his eternal, all-knowing perspective. Now, sometimes for us, that's hard to trust. <laughs> And that's why the tests of our faith, I believe, are rightly called a test of our joyful confidence in God. You know, in, in closing, I think it's important to note that this story sort of puts on full display one of the ultimate agonies. And that is a parent going through a difficult situation, a really difficult situation in the life of one of their kids. And, and for many of us, I think it's relatively easy to trust God when we're going through tough things in our own life, or maybe there's lots of uncertainties or even uh, lots of potential dangers or risks or whatever. But when it's someone else's life, the life of one of the kids in our lives or the life of some other close person we cherish and love, that's when it's really tough. That's when it's really a test of our joyful confidence in God. But interestingly, the story that this story points to, the story that the sacrifice or the binding of Isaac points to, which is the time when Jesus himself carried the wood of the sacrifice, the cross, on his shoulders, leading to a hill where he actually was put to death, laying his life down in selfless love to be a sacrifice for our sin, defeating the powers of death through the resurrection. Because of that story that this story points to, we can have the deepest kind of assurance that even when we go through the darkest of times and our the, the, even when we go through a test of our joyful confidence in God, at the end of the day, we really can rest in the goodness of God, the trustworthiness that he has shown most specifically, most clearly through Jesus, that he will do what is good, what is right, what is best. And that even death itself, the worst we can imagine, does not have the final word. And that is good news for us, no matter what it is that we're facing during these uncertain times. Let's pray together. Lord, we acknowledge fully that that is a truth easier said than lived into. We believe it. We ask you to help our unbelief so that whatever we're going through now or may go through in the future that tests our joyful confidence in you, we would in the end rest in just such a joyful confidence knowing that through Jesus our lives are wrapped up into your eternal life now and forever, and we see your love and your goodness so clearly through him. And that that might help us to trust even in the most difficult, scary, or uncertain times we face. May that be so. Amen. Well, I'm sad to be away from you this week, but I hope to be back together with you in person sometime soon. Until then, grace and peace.